What is a meaningful life and how do we celebrate it? How do we notice it? We chose to celebrate uh, printmakers who contribute significantly to all of us and decided unanimously this year out of easily a dozen candidates that Jim Hibbard was well worthy of the celebration in that he's changed so many lives. A special thanks to uh, PNCA and Christy and the print department for hosting us here and RAC for holding all the money and giving it back to us when we want it. And then for earlier um, award ceremonies, the uh, Portland Art Museum and the Gilkey Center, um, and especially to Christy and Tom for not only the space, but for the exhibition of, of Jim's stuff outside. And also thanks to uh, George for asking, uh, how can we thank Ray if he won't take money? <laughs> <laughs> that was the start of the whole thing. We, we thought we'd ask uh, Prudent Roberts, who is a, uh, a curator, a teacher, and a, a really wonderful person and lover of art. She would just say a few things. Prudence? Yeah. <laughs> say, a, say a few things. Okay. Okay. We're here tonight to honor Jim Hibbard, who really needs no introduction. And uh, besides, it really scares me to talk about artists and their work when they're present. So I'm not going to talk so much about your work while you're present. It just. Um, so what I'd like to do instead is focus on Portland's long interest in the print medium more from the perspective of an art historian and an art educator, which is what I am, and really explain how an artist such as Jim came to spend a large chunk of his career here in Portland and what that, how that community embraces printmaking and paper in general. I mean, I think that was one of my first impressions when I moved here in the 80s, was what a paper town it was. I mean, how, how much books and prints and graphic arts were were a part of this community. Okay, let me just give you a couple facts about Jim, facts you probably all know. He graduated from PNCA, got a degree from Portland State, and his MA in printmaking at the University of Iowa. He's a professor emeritus of PSU, where he taught for many years. He's a founding member of Blackfish Gallery and of Print Arts Northwest. For several years, he has lived in Guanajuato, where he created Pyramidal Grafica, the successor to Pyramid Press, his art space here in Portland. You can see that Jim's contributions as an artist, as an educator, and as an advocate for printmaking are considerable. And of course, he is a formidable artist, known both for the strength of his aesthetic vision and the virtuosity of his technique. And I just have to say, when I, when I first moved here, which was back in the 80s, when, when I started at the museum, I think it was John Weber who introduced me to your prints. And I remember looking at the first of your images, and I can't tell you exactly what the image was, but it just, the intensity of it just kind of sucked me in. I mean, that's my first impression of you, is, is just the virtuosity of, of what you can do. Um, okay, let's go back to the early days of Portland. I've done a fair amount of research on its cultural history during my time at the museum and since, just out of curiosity. And as far back as the 1880s, some of the leading families in Portland were really knowledgeable about prints. Um, I did my master's thesis on C.E.S. Wood, who was one of the founders of the museum and a collector of everything. I mean, he went bankrupt a couple times because he loved art so much and jewelry and everything else. But he had quite a print collection and he also was a big supporter of um, handbound books and um, small presses and things like that. His, um, his son, he published his son's poems, get, you know, got a small press to publish his son's poems. And he did, of course, illustrated versions of his own poems and so forth. So C.E.S. Wood was a huge in, um, influence. And um, the Lads, I'm sure you've probably heard about the Lad collection of prints. Well, it was William Mead Ladd and his wife Mary who began collecting. They were young in the 1880s. Um, they started, they bought their first print, which was a Seymour Hayden etching. And then they spent all their Christmas and birthday money that the family gave them every year to assemble this 
I guess by all accounts, just phenomenal collection of prints. And um, Mary Ladd collected ukiyo-e prints, and it was her gift of 800 prints to the museum in, in the 1930s that really started their collection. And the rest of the collection, the Ladds had this kind of up and down, down financial life, and they sold their collection to the museum in Minneapolis, mm. which Gordon Gilkey oh, no. was still furious about in 1980. So, <laughs> and actually, um, I when I was at the museum, I did some some correspondence with a curator there who was kind of cataloging that immense collection in Minneapolis and wanted to come out to Portland and sort of learn more about the who were the lads and where were they getting their material in those days. Well, I think where they were getting their material was from a gallery in San Francisco called Vickery, Atkins, and Torrey. And um, it was a kind of a West Coast um, offshoot of a New York gallery, which was known for its prints and for its support of um, sort of the, the etching revival and things like that. And this guy, and also Asian material. So the lads were buying from Vickery Atkins and Tory, and so was CES Wood. And Tory was the one who helped um, the, the uh, curator, Anna B. Crocker. Tory owned, I mean, this is sort of a, deviating from Prince a bit, but Tory owned, no, it's not, it comes back. <laughs> Tory owned, um, bought Marcel Duchamp's Nude Descending a Staircase from the Armory Show, and Anna B. Crocker in 1918 borrowed it for the Portland Art Museum. So we had, you know, the kind of, poster child of, of degenerate art in <laughs> Portland in 1918, and Tori lent a whole bunch of prints of other artists who had been in the show. So in 1918 in Portland, we had Picasso and Matisse and, um, and Anna B. Crocker, this forward-thinking curator, whom I've also done a lot of research on, did a lot of um, that kind of forward-thinking print shows in the ensuing years. So that, you know, there, there's just always been that kind of interest in print collecting, um, knowledgeable collectors. Henrietta Failing gave the museum its first Piranesi prints in 1916. Her father, Henry Failing, another of the museum founders, had put that collection together. And then again, if you look through rosters of museum exhibitions, you'll find that print shows were really plentiful and much more kind of out there than you might imagine in those years. And then, of course, you know, there have been other, uh, you know, we if you fast forward to the present, we have somebody like Jordan Schitzer, who's, um, I just got a mailing from the Museum of Contemporary Photography in, in Chicago, which is currently showing his John Baldessari prints. So, I mean, he's out there and putting Portland on the map, I think, in all kinds of ways. Um, then there are, of course, the great teachers who've been associated with PSU and with PNCA. And I think you start... Perhaps you start with Harry Wentz, but I think you really start with Bill Gibbler and what he did in terms of creating a printmaking program at the Museum Art School, you know, acquiring presses, making things professional, and um, turning on a whole bunch of people to printmaking in the ensuing years. And there was Louis Bunce, who uh, championed silkscreen printing early, early on, and other forms, I mean, Louis was... I didn't know him, but I feel as though I did because I've read so much about him. And then, of course, George Johansson and Manuel Izquierdo and Jim Hibbard, who really made the city a printmaker's destination in terms of education. And, uh, you know, another figure, of course, is Gordon Gilkey, who um, I think since he died, I've just sort of been aware, you know, when somebody dies, you sort of get to know them better in a way because they're standing still. And you just become aware of all the things that Gordon did over the years. That, I mean, it's phenomenal what he did, what what he did for the museum and what he did for the city and what he did for our reputation. Um, and then, of course, there are all of the ateliers, the well-known ones and the less well-known ones. Um, Tad mentioned a few tonight, um, starting with Inkling Studio, of course, and then um, no longer here, but Atelier Mars. Um, the Happy Fine Arts, Pro Shadow Press, and then, as I say, all these other uh, smaller, smaller places. Um, so I work now at PCC. I teach art history, and I run an art gallery out there. And I've been there for about nine years now. And in those nine years, I've really seen an explosion of interest in printmaking. We've had some really good faculty out at the Rock Creek campus, which is where I am. Um, our printmaking classes 
have been have been running at capacity. That and ceramics are our two most popular programs. Um, two of the most popular events of our recent Art Beat Festival, which happens in May, were a visit from the Drive-By Press and a really wonderful lecture from Sarah Horowitz, who I think gave students an understanding of some of the unique qualities of the printmaker's world. It's camaraderie, it's um, collaborative nature, and it's mystery. I think there's something, for, especially for a non-printmaker, there's something absolutely mesmerizing about printmaking. It's a kind of magic. It seems all chemical to somebody from the outside. And it's artists like Jim Hibbard who make that happen, and we're really grateful to them for their wizardry. Thank you. Jim Hibbert. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you look at the, the patina on the tables and tarlatans hanging, um, you'll probably agree with me that every printmaker must go into the black. <laughs> For although white is the light of inspiration, black is the enabling mud. Black is the track, the trail, and the testament that follows the flash of inspiration or the groping through the fog of impressions. And for a printmaker, it is black that creates the form. Black is the hand that reaches out of a perfect emptiness to give presence to say, here, now, black is our enabler. But printmakers also realize that there are many enablers, many partners that dig into the black with us to pull out the countless shades of black into nuanced fields of light. Enabling is truly a partnership. And much art would not exist without a partner, often overlooked, but essential to the creation of art. So here's to each and every one of you that serve as enablers. Um, Ray is also an exceptional enabler, building over 60, what, 63? 65, I don't know. <laughs> 60 something. Hurrah. <laughs> Um, asking only for material costs, not charging for his 200 plus hours of labor per press that includes custom engineering. But Ray enables us in another, even more important way. He gives us artists trust, respect, and enthusiasm in our efforts to make something from nothing, to visualize the unseen, unnoticed, or unimagined. Jim Hibbert is also a great and valued enabler a skilled master with profound vision, and yet, like Ray, humble and kind. He has spent his life making art and enabling others as a teacher, mentor, collaborator, and friend. His art, like Jim himself, has a quiet yet powerful presence that opens our eyes. We hope that the print prize will open other eyes to the deep role and essential presence in print printmaking that Jim embodies. He inspires us to ask, may our eyes be enabled that they become enabling. And now for the award. The Print Prize Committee selected Jim Hibbert this year for his dedication to printmaking and the printmaking community. His long involvement at PSU has, invited, has inspired and developed many artists. He was a key figure in the creation of Blackfish Gallery and the Northwest Print Council. And these are my words. He skillfully develops deep concerns with artwork of the highest level. He is able to create resonant, iconic emblems of existential questions that we all share. He is an architect of the reality below appearances. Moreover, his work converses with us personally, even as it does with his buddies like Durer and Piranesi. But most importantly, Jim Hibbert embodies the Ray Trail spirit of generosity and old-fashioned decency. Both Jim and Ray lived what could be called the good life, influential and yet modest, informed and involved. This award celebrates that kind of presence in the world. So we've got